Dear friends, uh, students, and uh, faculty members, and guests, we're uh, very happy to have Lars back here in Innsbruck. Um, you might think why, why I say back, because uh, he was here already in um, 2006 doing a lecture on his uh, book, Machining Architecture. And this lecture for sure less, uh, left a long-lasting mark here on this uh, student body and this faculty, because some of us, like um, Thomas, Florian, uh, Christoph, and myself and others uh, got the chance even to work for Lars in his office in Knox in Rotterdam in the last couple of years. So and after uh, watching his uh, incredible lecture uh, on, uh, at the AA last fall online, we all had the feeling that we have to revive this friendship and bring him back to Innsbruck and have a discussion with him and our professors. So we're very happy that he made his way here again in, in, uh, uh, to this university. And I'm sure his, uh, his lecture will be on his uh, new book, very inspiring book, Sympathy of Sa Things, which even has become or has become an, an Amazon bestseller, probably also because of, uh, yeah, in the, in the architecture section at least. <laughs> so, yeah. It is way be, be, uh, before uh, Patrick's book right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> and yeah, it's, but it's also maybe because we, um, we started this reading circle and Lese Zirkel and uh, there are a lot of, gr of green books running around this university here. So now, um, yeah, I will hand over the mic uh, to Bart Lotzmer. He's an old friend from back in the days, of Flowers from, from Rotterdam and yeah, who will give you more introduction. So, uh, enjoy, thanks. So, uh, good, good afternoon. Um, in, in a way, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed that I'm asking, of course, of course we, we, uh, Lars and I go uh, uh, not way back, but back, back until the, the, the 1990s. So therefore, I can, uh, the, the question was if I would say some personal things. But first, I would like to say some, uh, some, some personal things that are really important because this is a very special event. It is an event that has been organized by the students, by Thomas Busek, Moritz Keitel, Johannes uh, Lad uh, Ladinik, uh, Christoph Plana, and Theodor Wende. And that is, that is very special because uh, none of us professors ever managed to bring several professors together to do such a thing. And uh, which actually is, of course, uh, always extremely embarrassing. Uh, but uh, so what you what you uh, what you have arranged here is a really special thing. It's a special event with two uh, with uh, with Lars. It's on the occasion of a special book of Lars and a special book of uh, of also of Patrick, two of the most important books that have appeared the last couple of uh, a couple a couple of years. I think in architecture, really milestones. So, but first, I would like to have a big applause for for the people that organized this because that is really special. <laughs> so, uh, I, I'm also an astronaut. So, this is a lecture. There will be a discussion, uh, and uh, then there will be a buffet, and we will watch uh, soccer. Uh, the interesting thing is that. Also, the last time that Lars was here, uh, Patrick, uh, Lars and I watched, watched soccer. I always thought it was, it was the Netherlands against Germany. Lars thinks it's, it's the Netherlands against Portugal, but uh, I don't know. But it's uh, somehow always when Lars comes, uh, we, uh, we deal with soccer. Uh, but first, we do something else. Uh, Lars, uh, I have to be uh, there for very quickly so that we can indeed uh, also enjoy the soccer game. But Lars uh, um, uh, is, um, is, is a very uh, uh, special person. I'll, 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 to explain that, I'll, um, I have to, uh, to, to start at the beginning with something what I don't like. He studied in Delft. Well, that, that, that sounds like a kind of ordinary uh, obituary that I start now. But Delft, uh, I, I studied in Eindhoven, and I studied in another place. And Delft is this, this kind of uh, a, a huge building, this huge machine, uh, which seems very respectable and, and whatever, it, it isn't of course, uh, but uh, you think that, uh, that it pr produces as a kind of machine all kind of the same things. But Delft was of course, in this huge bunker there were always these, these niches. And these niches that uh, in the, uh, you have to imagine in the 1980s uh, were interested in Baroque. Uh, Lars is a connoisseur of bar Baroque, I, I realized in the, in, the, in the 1990s, I learned it from Lars. Uh, he wa they were reading Baudrillard, Virilio, 
uh, Deleuze in the 1980s, so way before the Americans were doing that, um, uh, which you really have to say, huh? uh, because it wasn't translated in English, yet. So they read it in French, they translated it. Um, so that's what he did when he, when he was studying, and uh, in a way that, 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 continue, that, that continued. So he, uh, he was a, a wonderful draw draftsman by hand, and I think also that is, that is important because still I think the book uh, that, he, uh, that he will talk about today, I sometimes had the feeling, at least in the beginning, that it's written by, not maybe an architect, but by a draftsman. It's, it's, it starts also about draw, uh, drawing. Um, so it was, it was from er very early on, it was clear that he was an, uh, an incredible talent and uh, everybody appreciated that. But he was a kind of special niche talent. So when he started his office Knox uh, with Ma Maurice Neo in the beginning, still also a kind of uh, very special person, they started, it was not just the office, but it was also a magazine in which they translated text into Dutch uh, of all kinds of people. And they had this kind of very peculiar niche architecture with which they were nevertheless uh, successful uh, as far as that went in the Netherlands in the 1990s uh, with the water pavilion that everybody knows. So when I, I, I learned to low, know Low Lars in the, in the early 90s, uh, I realized now that in 91 we traveled together to Japan. He, he reminded me of that and of course I remember, remember traveling with him. We did a lot of things, magazines together, all kind of things. But uh, what was a really special moment um, in this, this niche uh, office and his niche magazine is uh, when he met his wife, Joke Brouwer, which, uh, who, uh, who is very special. And I think it is, uh, I, I, I don't know if that's often said, but I think Joke brought you to digital culture, right? And, um, uh, and, that, was, uh, and uh, that was a very, uh, that is a very special relationship. Joke Brouwer is, uh, is founder of uh, the V2 Institute for Instable Media. So not new media, you know, instable media. And in the beginning, there was a very punky, also niche kind of counterculture thing, which still exists now, and it's one of the most interesting uh, institutes, so to say, for, uh, for media, instable media, I have to say, um, uh, in, in the world. She's also the designer of his books, and she's an adjunct director in this thing. So that's also a place where all kinds of people come, that, that Lars knows, that Lars meets, uh, philosophers, uh, artists uh, that deal with the digital culture. So that it was a, a kind of new layer, I would say, that, that developed there. So you're, you're also involved in that uh, in V2 yourself. Your book is published, uh, books are published by V2. So that, uh, that, that became something really important. So what, what, uh, what, 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 uh, what, what, what shall I say? I think uh, Lars is, uh, a real original in that sense. Uh, it, was, it came from this niche, uh, uh, niche culture in Delft, he, uh, and he was always a, a kind of niche person that did his own thing. And uh, he did that quite well. Uh, and um, but because of all this and this, this whole background, I think Lars is now internationally one of the, of the people uh, with the most profound and uh, visionary look on digital culture and architecture on the one hand, but he's always some, also someone who uh, is able to relate it to history, uh, and not just anymore to, uh, to Baroque, but at a certain point he de developed uh, John Ruskin, which is a kind of sur surprising discovery in many ways, and who, who became an important inspiration for his book. What shall I say? Uh, I'll, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is, of course, uh, a book, in a way, on architecture. You can still feel that. I think it's uh, also a, philosoph a, philo a, a book, uh, a philosophical uh, 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 book. Of course, uh, Lars said it's a book on aesthetic theory, uh, but it is a, an extremely rich and surprising uh, book. It is called uh, The Sympathy of Things. Uh, it's also a book uh, that engages you. Uh, has a, it's beautifully written, and it's uh, written in a way that engages you. Uh, I'm not sure if I should say uh, much more, uh, because, uh, uh, but uh, let's say, what shall I say? <laughs> Lars is probably the one architect and thinker that has a profound vision uh, on all the themes uh, that Anton Picon mentions in his book, and that is also the occasion for a discussion later, as Jan set it up. So we are very, very happy to have you here, and we're looking forward to your lecture. <laughs> Uh, that's all a bit embarrassing. 
I'm a niche person, a nicheist. <laughs> I've been trying to become mainstream for ages. Uh, <laughs> I failed so hard in architecture, now I'm trying a theory. Um, I have to look in that direction because I, there's not there's black here. Um, so, my goodness, um, what an intro! Um, n nor normally, you would read this from the left to the right. That would be a proper historical development. And uh, on the right is Fray Otto. and uh, I started looking at Fray Otto in, in 1998. I, m I met him in 1998, and. Um, <coughs> Which was actually, I'm, I didn't plan this to say this, but it was, that was really important to me. Why? Because um, uh, as we were, as we digerati, uh, as we digerati were obsessed by, uh, by folding and animation, I, uh, I saw Fray Otto do the reverse. Um, uh, there was a lecture in Salzburg, actually, and, um, and he, was, he was showing um, foam and he was showing sand and he was showing paper and he was showing that bull thread model. I'm not going to explain that to you. It's very complex. It takes me half an hour. And that it's it's really incredible. And uh, Fray Otto is Gaudi is one of the, the masters of analog computing. And uh, and he did the reverse to what we were doing, right? We were doing animations and then we had to s hit the stop button and then say that that looks like a museum. <coughs> it never looked like a hospital, right? <laughs> Somehow it always looks like a museum or a house for a weirdo. And, um, and then I saw Fray Otto, he's actually doing the reverse. He's doing these material agents, paper, sand, it's all flexible. And they find each other through a rule-based system and the rules are, are in the machine itself, how you set up the machine basically sets up the rules, like how Gaudi with his hanging catenaries, right? So there's rules to the catenaries because of the, the width and the length of the catenaries. And, uh, and it's the same with Fray Otto. So you start with movement, but you end with structure. It's the reverse. You don't always start with structure and then you sort of move to make it nice. No, you have, you have agents and they move and they interact and they find form, right? Form findung, yeah, that's German, which is the reverse of form gable. Right, so that's that's clear. So we're not mastering matter, but we actually uh, we having matter solve our problems for us. It finds form, and that was the first time I hit on this notion that drove me to the left side of of the, of the images. So through Zemper, which is in the middle, I I just I lectured about this like a month ago, and I saw these three images. I thought. They look very much alike, right? This is, this is like the, the knots of uh, page 183 of Zemper, they're still, right? And there you have, uh, well, it's not Ruskin, but it sort of stands, it's a stand-in image of Ruskin. It's a rose window. I read it from right to left. I don't read it from left to right. So I'm not going from Ruskin to Fry Alton and say, okay, now we need computing. No, I'm, 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 I'm there. Right outside of the frame with my machine, I'm going through materiality, through zemper, ornament, and an end in the Gothic. So I, I, I walk back with my laptop, and I, I like Doctor Who, I plop up at 1842, whatever, 1848. I'm, I'm standing there, and they're all shouting Chaucer and, and Walter Scott and medievalism, and I'm there with my laptop. So that's sort of the image. That's sort of the image I, uh, that, that I actually hit on when, when, uh, the, when I was reading Ruskin, because for Ruskin became very, very important to me. When I, uh, I wrote a book in, uh, in 2008, which is called The Architecture of Continuity, and a c continuity is really a term of Baroque, of, of the notion of folding. And, uh, <coughs> and I was already sort of floundering in, at that time, and I thought, yeah, I, I hadn't really solved it yet, so I'm, I'm using Ruskin, but I couldn't really solve it in, the, in that book yet. And then I started, when I finished that book, I started to like, this intro is already 15 minutes, no? so we're missing the game for sure. <laughs> Can we close the door, please? Because this will be a terrible night, I'm sure. Well, at least for one of us. <laughs> um, 
So I'm, 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 I'm finishing that, and I think I should really dive deeper and deeper into that. Now, the two other books I, I'm not showing is the, the, the research, and I, I have a full professorship at, uh, at the University Georgia Tech, the Georgia Institute of Technology, and I had a chair there for five years with a ridiculous budget, like 100,000 a year. <laughs> just to spend on books and, and symposia and models. So we, we did these six feet high towers and it was very difficult to spend that amount of money. <laughs> but now I don't have that budget anymore, but I still have the job. And, uh, but I, what I teach is, is sort of, uh, I, because I do Owen Jones and Ruskin and, 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 and Zemper in our classes as well. And um, that's really so good about a, a, a school like that that doesn't have sort of, that doesn't have digital design everywhere, right? It's Georgia Tech. It's really, well, it's on the periphery of digital design, so to speak. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's, it's, you have to touch, some, you have to somehow teach it in a way, a very methodological way. So we teach it materially. And we teach it historically. So we let students look at like weaving and, and macrame and crochet for like four, five, six weeks till they throw up. Um, because it, it, they're scared because they think like, what am I looking at Norwegian sweaters for, for four or five weeks, right? And, and all these techniques will feed into digital design techniques. So we start with methodology and techniques and then slowly bring in site. So site, we bring in like week 12. Site and program, we bring into week 12. So before that, it's all about beauty and patterns and, 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 and what we call figure configuration techniques. So what I'm basically saying is that we use the, the historical notion of, uh, of or let's say, the, hi the history of, of architectural problems, which I think are old problems. I don't think we have specifically new problems, not architecturally speaking. We have new problems in the sense of demography and uh, ethnography and all, all that. But in, let's say in the, in the politics of beauty, so to speak, we have only old problems, but we have no new tools to look at them. So that's what I do. I, I, I teach through very old techniques, and I teach Emperor and Ruskin and, and macrame and crochet to then sort of explore digital design. Now, I'm, I'm going to follow the book a bit. So I'm, I'm having four sections, and I'm already 15 minutes over, and this is going to take ridiculously long. Um, so there's Gothic, there's ornament, there's sympathy, and there's a, what I call politics of beauty. So there's, there's, four, there's four, each will be like an hour. Please tell me when you want me to stop. So Gothic is first, and Gothic is, uh, became very, very interesting for me uh, be because of the studies of, of, of Ruskin. And um, this, is, uh, the, the, this is the publication by William Morris. Um, uh, the nature of Gothic, the, the, of course, the, there's two very important chapters in the Stones of Venice. This is actually the Stones of Venice, it's three volumes, written when it was 32. Right, between 32 and 34, he wrote th f three volumes, and, and it's in the second volume, there's the nature of Gothic and the material of ornament. So my first chapter is the digital nature of Gothic, and my second chapter is the matter of ornament. Right, so we have the, the digital nature of Gothic and, and the matter of ornament, both related to Ruskin's writing. And, and the nature of Gothic has been republished over and over, and this is the, the famous Kelmscott uh, uh, edition by, uh, by Morris, and it already says, how Ruskin sees, he really sees himself as a very, very much alike Pugin, as, a, as not just somebody advocating the Gothic or, or a sort of northern form of, of the Gothic or a especially English form of the Gothic and medievalism, but it's much more for him an anti-classicism. He's a hardcore anti-classicist and he is an anti-classicist in the way that it allows him to attack Victorian industrialism. So the way he connects, let's say, his critique of classicism to Victorian industrialism is the same way how I connect the Gothic to my critique of modernism, right? If you, if you read this book, and there will be every 13 pages, there will be some fulmination, some, some angry paragraph against modernism and the sublime. I really think the sublime 
is, is the aesthetics of, of modernism. And, it, and after 19, basically modernism is between 1914 and 2001, right? So that's the, 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 two, the two dates of fire. Modernism started with fire and it ended with fire. And, it, and in between there was only fire. <laughs> Rothko, uh, media, uh, television, there we go, the first people leaving. <laughs> Uniformity, <laughs> Barnett Newman. Uh, basically, uh, I, I see it as, as one expose of the sublime. There's books that are being written on the technological sublime that, co that connect a very specific form of the sublime. The building of dams, of highways, high speed is really an experience of the sublime. Bungee jumping, that's the sublime. What could Caspar David Friedrich ever have thought, right, about bungee jumping? <coughs> One Rücken builder and you're out of the image, right? You jump with your elastic band out of the image. So uh, th for him, Ruskin, that was, it was really a critique on, on Victorian in industrial culture, the culture of the, of the copy. So he says, uh, what, what is this classicism? It's an architecture event to make plagiarists of its architects. Right, because it's an a priori architecture. You teach classicism, you teach a suitcase full of columns, pedestals, friezes, domes, whatever. You leave the school with a book of Serlio and a book of Palladio, and you, the rest of your life you just copy. You just you put parts together. It's just, it, you're a mechanic. You're a mechanic. A slave of its workmen, it's even worse, slave of its workmen. I mean, you can be a well-paid plagiarist, but a slave right, that your architect draws a meandering band and you're like the whole day you're spanning on this freaking meandering band that you're not allowed to do anything with. And separates hedonists of its inhabitants, right, so it's, he connects it to decadence as well, right. So he's basically saying there, it's not just classicism I'm talking about, I'm talking about my contemporary Victorian culture. So that's the way I'm transposing it, so I'm, I'm Doctor Who, I'm taking Ruskin and putting him back in my phone booth and going back to 2011 at that time. So that was another 15 minutes. Six characteristics, and I have 80 slides. Six characteristics of, of, of the Gothic. Uh, savageness, changefulness, rigidity, I'm doing the wrong order, Red redundance and, and grotesqueness. Right, so the six characteristics, and this is already important because First of all, you will not see in any art history, well, any art history book on the Gothic by Paul Franco, by Hans Janssen, uh, by, by, by Jean Bonny, by uh, Erwin Panofsky, they will never, ever, ever, ever quote Ruskin. So you will ne only Paul Franco, there's one quote, and he says about Ruskin, oh, that dilettante, right? So he's, he's seen as a dilettante, so somebody who knows nothing. Is like l lower than an architect, right? Like it's lower than an architect. And, uh, and what's so interesting about this theory of the Gothic, it, there's no formalist rules and there's no art historical analysis, they're just aspects, they're just characteristics of the Gothic, savageness and, and, and changefulness. For me, the most important one, the first two, but I, I will also talk about rigidity. So first savageness, I will do that very short. Normally that's the most important because people that are sort of still proponents of Ruskin, they normally quote his ethical side, right? Savageness means, normally in, in Ruskin's view, it means that the Gothic is such an open system that it allows the workman, and that's a workman, a very Nor Nordish, in, you would say in German. It's a Nordicist workman. So his head is in the mist, his, his feet is in the clay, he's a rough guy, he's like, uh, it's like, a, like from Iceland. Right, this is like the, the roughest person, and he has to make mistakes. He has to make mistakes. So there, there's a, there's a Nordicism here, but that's I will leave that scary part out of out of Ruskin. But you will see a lot of that in Warringer, by the way. Warringer talks about the Aryan. Anyway, not so important now. Um, so we got savageness. It, it connects to um, something that has been theorized already, uh, like a uh, hundred years before Ruskin, as as rough variation. So if you read the, the, the earlier text on the picturesque by uh, people like William Gilpin or Uverdale Price, it will be about sudden variation. So before that, we get smooth variation, 
somebody like uh, Hutchison or Hogarth, they would talk about the gradual variation, which is smooth variation. You see the same in Burke. There's a lot of names. Don't forget them. So you get smooth variation and rough variation. A savageness that starts with the picturesque. And that's normally like when you get in a landscape, you get like rough rocks. So it's not a sublime, but it's a mini sublime, right? There's rocks, there's crevices, there's fractures. And with Ruskin, Ruskin connects that idea to two ideas of, 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 of Gothic architecture. One is the small ornament where that savage person is allowed to make mistakes. So it's open to imperfection. He says the true sign of life is imperfection. But the other is massing. The other is mass. Is that rain? Oh, wow. OK. Wow. OK. So beautiful. Rain. Anyway, the massing, which is, which is really interesting, because we think smoothness is somehow related to massing, right? But for, for Ruskin, there's, there's like the lowest scale level is savage, and the highest scale levels is, is, is savage. You could add another spire. You could add an octagon. You could stop adding your transepts. Gothic architecture allows a lot of that type of mistake. It's not on the, on the scale of the workmen. It's, of course, the scale of the community, of the, of the village or the region that builds that church and says, no, no, let's build the other spire. Which is incredible, right? Can you, can you imagine Balthasar Neumann doing this on a drawing? No, it's not. It's only because they don't have a drawing or they threw the drawing away, right? So there's this open system and there's, there's symmetry at the ground. And that's actually what allows that asymmetry. It's not just like somebody deciding to just put another part on it. No, no, there's symmetry here. And there it goes asymmetrical. And that's, re that's really something, right? That's, that's, that's a much more intelligent uh, asymmetry than let's take one arm off of Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, right? You have the Vitruvian Man symmetrical. It's all in proportion. You cut one arm off, it's asymmetrical. But in this case, it's not one arm off, it's one arm moving, right? Or one arm stretching, or it's one leg going like this. So there's a symmetrical organization, but it's an asymmetrical form which architects cannot understand, right? For them, the diagram is the form. But in this case, it's not. It's the diagram that generates, but you grow away from the form. And that's the asymmetry of the Gothic. OK, but in between, in between these two scales, we have changefulness, which I think is really quite an incredible invention, especially in the way that Ruskin uses it, <coughs> because it's all about perpetual novelty. It's all about perpetual novelty. So somehow, if you're a classicist, you cannot, with all these a priori elements, you're, you, you, you're not capable of producing novelty. Right? Palladio can only repeat Palladio and Palladio the same. You can only repeat a priori elements. Maybe you can change their combinations, but it will never change the order. And in this case, there's perpetual novelty. How is that possible? How is that possible? So there's a change not just of combination, but of the figures themselves. Of the figures themselves. And you already see the perpetual novelty is in the pointed arch, the group shaft, the trick of the rose window, of the window, of the, of the webbed vault. There's a, that's it, there's a whole set of, of architectural types that are prototyped by another state. And, and that's really the most interesting. If you looked at this, as the, what he says about the group shaft and the table that he gives us, we see all columns here, but not one of them is the same. Not one of them is the same. Try that with the Parthenon. Try that with, 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 uh, with Palladio or Salio. You will see all the same sections with the same fluting, maybe changes number, but it's, it's the same column, just changes scale. But in this case, there are groups of things Right? And we, these things we call colonnettes or ribs, right? And just like mini columns. They're mini columns. And you see the same mini columns in rose windows or tracery windows. And I'm not talking about style, I'm not talking about the perpendicular or the flamboyant or uh, the mid pointed, whatever, the decorated. I'm, I don't care about the art historical concept. I'm talking about what is actually in the Gothic that allows it to produce perpetual novelty. Because there's something inherent to the Gothic, right? And that's the rib. 
right? So there's somehow they invented this element that is undefined. How is that possible? Because there's an element we always say it's finite, right? It has to be discrete, it has to be an object, right? You have to teach it. You know, that's a rib, right? But it doesn't mean anything in itself. It cannot stand on its own, it cannot do anything on its own, it looks lonely, it's too thin, it's too thick for ornament, it's too, th too thin for a structure. So what do you do? You actually bundle it when, when you want to make a collar. So there's an extra act. And that extra act, that action, is actually the act of bundling. That makes it a configuration. Right? So we go from the figure state of a rib to the configuring state of a column or a bolt or a rose window or any type of tracery. So there's a, there's a figural state and there's a configurational state. Uh, you see one of the most beautiful ones, that's Wells Cathedral, that's Gloucester. Uh, somehow Ruskin never looked around the corner. He always had to travel over the channel, through northern France, through Normandy, go all the way over the Alps, right? And then go to Venice and see this sort of really terrible version of the Gothic, right? Which he advocated and it worked. But it was actually the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful examples of the Gothic was exactly in the opposite direction you always traveled. Yeah. Can you believe it? You live in London, you don't go to Gloucester and Wells, right? No, is it going over the channel and then Normandy? Of course, Normandy is, is the home of the flamboyant, so that's, that's the most incredible Gothic. But look at this. Harry Potter was filmed over there. Now, <coughs> so there is this rib, there is this rib, and there's this, there's this f the flexibility of the rib, which makes it as a figure. Now, no art historian will look at figures. They will tell you a motif, okay, but for the rest, the Gothic is made up of lancets, it's made out of finials, of, 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 of all types of, uh, of, of, of formalist type. You have cusps, you have ogives, you have ogs, whatever. There's a whole list in any, in any art historical book on the Gothic. You will see that, but we'll never look at the figures. Because there's J figures, there's C figures, there's S figures. There's a whole bunch of them. And then we start, like with our digital eyes, we start looking at these figures and start to vary them and configure them. Right? Because now these figures, and these are not circles or, right? They're just like the, the shaft of the J can become longer or the, the arc of the J can become longer. They are, they're all like out of proportion towards each other. They can all vary, which is different than proportional variation. Right? So there's a freedom of the figure that allows them to configure with others. Right? Figures never bend because they're happy by themselves. Right? They're always bending because they meet others. They meet others. And that means it's a structural notion here. There's a structural notion which, which we can't say is actually, is it, is it like ornament or is it structure? Because it's configurational, that means it has structural properties. But it's because of the scale of the rib, it also has ornamental properties. So there's some, they invented some in-between world Right, that is also because of this in-between indeterminate element, the rib, allows them to vary and vary and vary. Well, we have hundreds of pages of these. And then we get Warringer, and Warringer sort of writes this weird, weird book, forming Gothic, uh, for Probleme de Gothic, I should say, uh, which has, a, has some pages that Deleuze always quotes about vitalized geometry. I will talk a bit later about vitalized geometry. But it's really the, the, the most interesting. <laughs> because in architecture we know geometry and then we want to vitalize it, we put like little acanthus leaves on, or garlands, or volutes. That's, that's what our Betty told us. Right? We, we, we have structure first and we put ornament on it to make it lively. Right? So we start with abstraction and we, we need to make it em empathizable. <laughs> we, make it, we make it alive by adding putti and garlands and fruits and, and leaves. Right? But that's not what happens here. This is the geometry itself that goes alive, that becomes alive. Right? So that, that's exactly what happens with this bundling. Right? You have the figures, and the figures configure by deformation, by, by flexibility, and they, and they find that determined state. And for Warringer, that's connected to something that happened much earlier, like four or five hundred years earlier, which is illumination, which is another Nordicist. Uh, argument, 
But at, at, it's a really interesting notion that you get the Celts and, and, and the Anglo-Saxons going to England, then the, the Vikings go back to, uh, to Norway, and then from Norway we go to Normandy, and there we got Gothic architecture, that, and these Normans go, with their flamboyant minds, they go to England. So you get some kind of loop of people braiding and interlacing and doing knot work. And what's so interesting about Boringer is that he, he sees that. And of course, Boringer is the last one, right? This is 1911. So we're just, just three years before, 19, before the fire starts, right? So this is the last, the, the last hint of, of, of empathy and, uh, and, 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 and ornament and vitalism. <coughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm putting Boringer on the same, on the same level as... Uh, as, uh, as, as Ruskin. Ruskin uh, relates a lot to Gothic uh, uh, or to Celtic knotwork, also to the, the uh, illumination. He has a lot of text on that. He says, I'm obsessed with embroidery, with the filigree work. So he sees really that sort of abstract notion of, of, of ornamental structure as, 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 as a basis of the, of the Gothic. And then he works with John F. Millet on his. Uh, it, well, that's a, it's a very famous story. He, he goes on holiday with Miele and, and, and Ruskin's wife, Effie Gray. And out of that comes the most famous divorce of the Victorian age, right? <laughs> Ruskin, I'm, I'm not, that's a, it's a fantastic story. <laughs> the marriage is annulled because of non-consummation. Um, Ruskin forgot to sleep with his wife. And he was so busy with the Gothic, <laughs> hopping about in Venice, he forgot to sleep with his wife. Uh, she got really annoyed. And then uh, <laughs> four years later, she, she meets John Everett Millet. And they, they marry and they get eight children. And <laughs> but Ruskin, for that year, that year, 1853, that this is two years after the Crystal Palace, um, um, Ruskin is planning a series of lectures in Oxford, and, and one is on the, on the flamboyant. And he, he uh, at that time, still friendly with Millet, and, and during the summer in Scotland. And they're trying to invent a new Gothic. They're, and there's like five drawings of Millet. And this one he blew up. This is like two and a half meters by two and a half. It's now owned by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And uh, yeah, it was, in the, it, it was first in the, in the Lutyens family, the famous architect Edwin Lutyens, and then it went to his sister, uh, it's, uh, his daughter, Mary Lutyens, who wrote a few books on Ruskin and, and Effie Gray. But th this is my image of, of how we, we should understand this notion of craft, because we think always craft is something coming after, after design, right? when we execute design, when we materialize. But here you see the hands of the angels are the hands of tracery. Right? So there's a notion of craft and of weaving and braiding that is inherent to design. That's my digital argument. Right? So you get figures, and these figures are alive. We would say they're, you would say they're parametric. I would say they're alive. <laughs> and they feel for each other. And while they feel for each other, they configure. They build configurations, either bundles of columns or networks of, of windows or networks of vaults. But these objects are collaborations, as, as, as William Morris would call them. And, and that's the image of it. That's the image. So they're spirits inhabiting matter. This is animist theory. This is animist theory. They're spirits inhabiting matter. And they make matter curve and connect up. See all the hands. So there's craft in design, and there's design in craft. So we should never think about materiality afterwards. There's always a materiality in advance, but it's something else than being preformed. <coughs> his notion of rigidity, normally Ruskin is laughed at, especially because it's not understanding of structure. Right? It's always two-dimensional, but his text on, on rigidity, one of the six characteristics, so changefulness, uh, savageness, and rigidity. I'm not discussing the other three. He says there's an active rigidity. So we're not talking classicist balance and rest here. There's an active rigidity. So somehow these parts that were holding hands are still holding hands there. They're not walking away because the structure is done. Right? They're not putting off the light like burkers. No, no, they're still there. The effort is still there. 
right? So it's an active rigidity. It's really like Latour, right? There's not just things, but these things are thing actions, so what he calls actants, right? So these, there's constant actuality of, of formation going on. There's actual, actual formation. Now, the guy who really hated that notion of, of indeterminacy in structure was, of course, Villers le Duc, who was always hailed as uh, as the first uh, as the first director of Arab, right? As the first high tech engineer, as one who cleaned everything out, who made every element a determined state, right? So it's not just a finite state of the rim but it's now also determined as an either an element of compression or tension. Nothing in between, right? There's been tons of fights between the Villeneuve Duc people that said, okay, the Gothic tried to solve structural problems, and then there's the Paul Abram people who said, no, no, it's a joke. The ribs don't carry any load. And the truth is, it's doing something in between. So there's churches that were bombed in the, in the Second World War that still have the ribs standing, but the rest of the vault collapsed. So that's structural, that's structural. But it's clearly also used to have the structure put up first as, 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 a, as a materialization of, of, of the lines that you drew and then put like the brickwork in between. You just need that guidance of, of the rib. But he saw it all as high-tech stuff, right? This, Kenneth Frampton calls it the, the start of the space frame. And that's what it is. It's, it's the, it's Pure modernist transparency coming over us. This is the start of the sublime, right? This is the start. This is he takes the vitalization out of the geometry and gives us pure rhomboids and parallelograms and circles and whatever. This is totally cleaned out modernism coming towards us, right? That's the start of the fire. That's 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 the other thing. So beauty precedes structure means. There's actually desire of these figure elements, of these octants, of these thing actions, these ribs, becoming configurational and producing structure. So the act of standing up, the act of elevation, is actually a product of beauty. It's not that you have structure first and then put leaves on it and little babies and, and garlands and fruits just to make it nice. Right? It's a complete reversal of the notion of, of beauty. Complete reversal. I got another few reversals. So Gothic continuity, but it's not a Baroque continuity. It's another type of, of continuity. There's no elements, and they bundle <laughs> because these elements can sort of connect with each other. This is discontinuous. Why it's discontinuous? Because all the elements are pre-cooked, right? So this is the Alberti model. It's actually Palladio structure, but it's, this is the Alberti model. So you get the structure cleaned out and then added incidental ornaments, right? Of course, in the Gothic, the ornament is, is structural. It's like everywhere there's this transition, transition of structure to ornament. Where there you only get like at the incidence of the, of the joints, right? That's what, 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 what Frampton's notion, Frampton's notion of, of Zemper wants to tell us that there's like the, li the life of the ornaments is only at the, at the joints. <laughs> now my next step. Is of course, that's, that Gothic continuity is very different from the Baroque continuity. I, re I'm really, I started as a friend of Baroque and Leibniz and, and Deleuze, and I ended in a fast-forward move away from it. And, uh, and, <coughs> and I really found that, that that's, where, that's where the depth of our mistake was in, in the early 1990s, that we read the digital as a sort of Leibnizian Baroque theater of the fold of, of, of parametric universalism. Of parametric universalism. So what, what do we have? Basically, Baroque is just classicism on acid, right? So, hey, everything is there already. Everything is there already. The columns are there. The pedestals are there. The friezes are there. The domes are there. It's all there. You just put it in acid or, or some other liquid. And then it goes a bit wobbly. Then it goes a bit, but the relationships are, st are exactly like classicism, a priori relational system. While there, right, the acid is in the elements, and they happily connect up. So this, is, this is exactly the refer, and this is my Fray Otto argument, right? Though I now prefer the Gothic over Fray Otto, 
I now prefer, <laughs> I prefer, well, they do it much cleaner. They have a much better view of what is beautiful. With Fray Otto, it's basically all cont contingency. That's the problem. It's still very close to Jackson Pollock. Right? There's a lot of wobbly stuff going on, and it forms structure, but it's so contingent. It's so contingent. It's like Pollock. It's just drip, drip, drip. And that's these, these, all these members have eyes, and they all feel for each other, and it's, it's full of coordination and congressence, as Whitehead would say. It's full of congressence. That means they grow together. So there's all that formation is, is, a, is a collective notion of, uh, of beauty. <sighs> I could stop here, but I have another 60 slides to go. So there you go, Greek sticks. Greek sticks. Now I connect it to philosophy, right? We've got pluralism, monism, and Gothic ontology. Now I'm calling, it, I'm calling this Gothic ontology or entanglement theory, right? So we've got sticks. This is atom or, or mechanism. That's organicism, right? That's fold. So the organic whole is already there, but the singularities are produced by folds. And every fold is a singularity. You're a singularity, you're a singularity. We're all singularities, but we're all connected by the one which is Jesus, or God, or it's, it's very Catholic. It's a Catholic theater that needs to pulverize matter into stucco. And then we call Arab, and they throw steel behind it. Right? They throw the steel behind it. That's just steel. Right? So we just start with sticks. All matter is preformed, but preformed, we put them together. So that's why we have joints. That's the that's world of joints. Right, that's preformed. That's unformed. This is underformed. Right, these, all these elements are finite, but they're not finalities, so to speak. In philosophical terms, they're not finalities in the sense that they're not determined to do this or that, because they always form combinations. So this is a fiber world of ribs. That's the world of folds. That's the world of sticks. Greek, Baroque, Gothic. <coughs> so that's where I am in warm world. So I accept, let's say, on, on the level of what we call nowadays object-oriented ontology, I accept the Heideggerian start of things. I, I accept that we start with things and not with a monist ocean that things pop out of. So I accept that we start with things. It's just that the problem in, in, in pluralism is that the things can only move. They cannot transform by themselves. That's, of course, a world of pure transformation. Because monism needs to fall, so they, they, there's constant evolution and transformation. That's an in-between state, right? So we get discrete elements, worms, or fibers, or ribs, but they're line-like. They're, they're, they're point-like, right? They're, that's atomism. They're points, and the points with vectors. Here they can internally change. So here they can both move and transform. They're like, basically, they're like folds on their own. Right? So they're faults without continuity preceding them. Continuity actually is a, pro a product of these things interacting with each other. Right? So it's, it's in that sense, it's between Heidegger and uh, Spinoza or Deleuze. <coughs> I don't want to make it too complicated. Ornament. So I'm, do I still have time? I'm not even halfway. Um, I will lose anyway. Ornament. So, it, I mean, I could not believe I would actually start writing about ornament. But um, when you accept the transformation of structure to ornament, you have to you have to accept the, the reverse uh, transformation also from ornament to structure. And the 19th century is full of people that theorized the structural notion of ornament. It, it, the ornament in 19th century is not the added acanthus leaf or the added molding or the added garland. They are what they call diapers, structural surfaces. And it all started like with people like Owen Jones going to Alhambra and looking at these netted webbed surfaces. They were ornate surfaces, but they were ornate surfaces not with dog or, or like what any kind of stuff. They were actually elements that interlacing of, and having very complex relations and creating a surface, right? So we got the world of Zamper and Owen Jones and Ruskin and William Morris that suddenly advocates an ornament that is a complete surface, is a complete surface. 
Now, this is an image from, from the strangest chapter in the, first, in the first volume of Stones of Venice. Stones of Venice, the first chapter, the first volume, is, is quite standard, what they in Gothic theory call membryology. So you're looking at the members as if you're a classicist, right? So you're looking at columns and pedestals and whatever. And, and there's chapter six, it's only four pages, on the wall veil. So it's not column or wall, no, it says wall veil. It's a very strange term. And what makes it strange, it doesn't start about talking about walls, it starts about the Matterhorn, Mont Servin at that time. So you get three page or six pages, you get three pages on the Matterhorn. <laughs> okay. But it's an incredible text. It's really incredible. Why is it incredible? Because he talks about the, of course, he's in 19th century. So totally interested in, in geology. And he's looking at the tectonics of, of forces that create that enormous volume that he describes as a building, but really as a, as a proto-expressionist, that Gombrich calls him a, a expressionist. This is really a, a set of forces that incredible volume of, of the Matterhorn. But that volume can only be created because there are geological layers that he calls courses. Now, courses are, are, is a term for the courses of brick. Right? That's why you get our field at, is not, this is the street. Reading the pages on the Matterhorn, it changes design for Keeble College immediately. There's courses of different types of stone. This by classicist scholars has been called the ugliest building of Victorian age. Now you go to Oxford, you immediately go to Keeble College. It's incredibly beautiful. It is, it's amazingly beautiful. I don't have a picture of it, so I can just say whatever I want, and you believe me. But this is very close to it. It's G Street. This is the Strand, right? The Strand is, a, is the, only, the only building in London Invited. Only Gothicists were invited, and, uh, 12 of them. And uh, OG Street, uh, all, all these people, William Burgess. And uh, because normally you would have co competitions with the battle of styles inherent to it. You would have classicists between and, and, and Gothicists. But that's the only one. And that's the Gothic front is, is beautiful, that building. It, it's, it's a huge law court, and they send people to death. For it's just you go to that building on the Strand, you, the most beautiful Gothic building, and they had so many death penalties. It's just incredible to just put these images together. On the back side, you get streaky bacon style. That's what they call the streaky bacon. It comes directly from the description of the, of the, of the Matterhorn. <coughs> he calls it the wall veil. Now, the veil is, is, is a really interesting term. I can't go too long, but it's, I call it the third way in ornamentation. So let, let's say let, the other two are modernist transparency and, 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 and Baroque or postmodern masking. Baroque drapery or postmodern masking. So the mask doesn't have any depth, it's opaque, doesn't have any depth. And structured, of course, transparent skin, mies, whatever, uh, foster. It's fully transparent, so there's full depth. Now here, this is another theory, it's the veil, so it, it is, it has, it is all about surface, but there's a depth to the surface. It's a transformation of structure. It's not, you see, don't see structure through it, but you see some structure, you see the structure of the ornament through it. And that structure of the ornament is derived from the structure. Like the courses of stone, right, they call it not, not because in Germany you had a form of, of uh, Greek polychromy, and, and, the, and the, the, the streaky bacon style they called constructive polychromy, right? So there was actually an expression of structure as, as much of, of structure, as much of, as ornament. <coughs> so I connect that notion of, of structure becoming ornament or ornament becoming structure to delicacy or, f or fragility. So fragility is really an, a notion of the object with structure, not as strength, not as that Doric par Parthenon that you saw on the left 
a few slides ago, but really something fragile, and that exposes its fragility. And of course, the, the Gothic is, is a style of the fragile. Though the columns are thicker than any Gor Doric column, right? so the strength is larger. But that's not the point. It's not an engineer's term. It's really an, a designer's term, because it's made out of all these thin elements. It makes it fragile. Right? You go to Chartres, or you go to Wells, you see fragile elements interacting, making a thin study. So guilloche, inlay, filigree, fretwork, there's a, there's a, whole, there's a whole history of, uh, in ornament that is structural ornament and, and, and is about delicacy. Well, Zemper, uh, how far am I? I skip Zemper. So my, my, my theory of Zemper is Frampton read Fr uh, Zemper wrong. Why? Because he all, he, for him it's all Bekleidung. And I think what's more important than Zemper is the Stoffwechsel taste. <laughs> so it's not Bekleidung in the sense that we throw ornament on top of, of a structure, but it's actually about the hardening of a flexible system. If you see the four elements, there they go. Uh, earth, timber, textile, and heart, the, the, the fire. It's actually f it's clear that from the steel is that the textile is the most important element. And that textile is not just draped like in the Caribbean hut on a, on a wooden tectonic structure, but the textile has its own tectonics of weaving and braiding and bundling and all that crochet and all that. So that's a whole world of the knot work. Right? And the knot work is really an expression of continuity, not of discontinuity of the joints. So I think Frampton got it all wrong with reading Zemper and giving it to Zomtor and all these people. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, I, I, th I think Zemper is really a theoretician of matter and pattern, and that he understands how, how textile in its soft state starts to inform and qua stoffwechselteise, qua. qua uh, change of matter, transformation of matter becomes stone, right? So the weaving of, of textile becomes the carving of stone. It's of course a magical moment, right? But it's really about this rigidity of, of, of becoming rigid of a flexible system. So I'm reading Zemper through Gothic eyes, that's, that's clear. The hanging carpets, it's quite, quite clear that, that, that Zemper got his, first he got his weaving theory from, uh, from Owen Jones. Owen Jones went to the Alhambra in, 19, in 1834 uh, with Hugh Goury. Uh, Zemper talked to him in the early uh, 1840s and, uh, and the 1850s. And then he saw Owen Jones hanging the carpets from India in the Crystal pa Palace and he started talking about the ha hanging carpets. I think there's a direct, direct relationship between Owen Jones and, 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 and Zemper. So yeah, this is in English, which is ridiculous because you should read it in German, Zemper, but it's <laughs> from an English. So I don't have to explain you the, the relationship between Wand and, and Gewand and uh, why, why Wand is so much more interesting than Mauer. But of course, it's a theory of ornament. It's not, a, it's not an advocation of Japanese architecture or the modernist hollow wall. Right? Everybody started re reading Zemper as, a, as an advocate of hollow walls and, and composite architecture. But it's really, it's a really a theory of ornament. And then, I'm, I'm skipping a few pages, but this now I have to go a bit more quickly. That transformation thesis, right? that strophexaltation, now becomes a much larger materialization through pattern. Right? So things that are agents either stripes or mud or rivers or dunes that are agents in the Friotto sense, now create pattern, right? So nothing comes through undecorated. Nothing comes through undecorated, right? So there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's nothing as natural as makeup. There's actually a sentence in the book, is the wild is the home of makeup. The wild is the home of decoration. So tigers are painted, trees are painted, uh, mountains are painted. There's nothing as artificial as nature, right? So there's a, there's a zest, there's a zest for decoration in nature. We just don't read it like that, but we should read it like that. This this whole notion of constant patterning, right, is 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 a, the most natural form of of matter to express itself. Uh, 
So it's transitory. Now I'm, I'm going quickly, but it's Stoffwechseltase, of course, is about transition. And there you go, the two main transitions of ornament. One is from a surface to lines that you see on the left, which is called tessellation. So you start with a, 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 a pool of mud, and it dries up and it cracks. That goes from a second dimension to a first set of first dimension lines. So it goes from surface to line. The other is ribboning. So you get lines interlacing, interacting to form a surface. So it goes from, from the first dimension to the second. So we get tessellation, tessellation ornament. So there's two types of ornament, but it's all about how they find that transition, how they're not becoming 2D, and how the other one does not stay 1D, right? But find somewhere in between. It's a bit technical. There's a lot of types of configurations of tessellation. Of course, deeply studied, there's 17 possible types. Actually, all 17 are in the Alhambra. So uh, Owen Jones started studying these. This is 1834, incredible images. Look at that. So the formation of ornament, the formation of texture, basically we're talking with uh, Ruskin with his, with his notion of the of the Matterhorn, where form and texture sort of become one and become one expression. You see the same in, in savage ornament, right? Savage tribes. It's the first the first plates are on savage tribes. Actually the first image of the grammar of ornament is the is the famous decapitated head of the Maori, the tattooed Maori head. It's a beautiful image, I'm not showing it now, but it's it explains you very clearly how Owen Jones thought about ornament and massing. It is the massing of the head and how that collaborates with the stripes of the ornament. It's quite amazing. But he makes a mistake, like lots of people that are interested in tessellation. It's all order to them. And order meets for them meets rest. So things interact and then they come to rest. And that's that word repose. So for him, the grammar of ornament is really a grammar of repose and, and rest and, and balance. But that's not necessary at all. There's also types of tessellation that are much more complex. Of course, we understand that now much better through parametrics. This is uh, uh, Roger Penrose, of course, with the kite and the dart. Uh, Nobel Prize winner, forgot his name. Look at these, how complex that is. But there's no way you can find symmetries, only local symmetries in there. And they're dry stone walling. Dry stone walling, they look all like different polygons, but the nodes are all Y-shaped. Right? There's an extreme consistency of the system just by having the Y-shaped nodes vary their angles. Uh, you get the same with mud cracking, of course, but these are T-shaped nodes. Right? So there's a whole variation of, 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 of nodal systems in tessellation. You see, you start with the grid, and that's order for you. That's the order for you, and it goes into very complex states. So it doesn't mean that tessellation is wrong or bad, not at all. There's a lot of movement, but you have to really fight through your examples, right? Because a lot of the, the people or the architects that are interested in tessellation will give you, try to give you gestalt or order. You see a, an example that we did with students, this is only like 10 years ago. But you see that the hexagonal pattern of the cylinder when it's bent and then bulged breaks into a very complex state of still three-legged nodes, right? Bec because between three circles, there's a three-legged three node Y-shaped, right? There's a, there's a fully consistent system. So you shouldn't look at the circles or the polygons, but it's actually on the nodes that makes the system uniform. Ribbon ornament. Louis Sullivan, Torgi Mar. This is an example of the of, of 1130. This is a, a Viking church, right? but you see some examples of, of ribboning, which is of course where ribbons interlace to make surfaces. Braiding. Look at that. You, know, you would have no student looking at Bavarian braiding or Dutch braiding. Yeah, <laughs> they always just like throw up. But if you look at that with digital eyes. Right, as, as a flexible systemacy, because that's what it is. It's a set of figures, a very precise set of figures. And these figures all have their own amount of variation. It's very well, very well preset. So they have freedom, but not all freedom. Right? There's a bias in the system. 
And that bias allows it to make braids or to, or to cover surfaces or to go from like strands to very complex single strands. It's a, it's a very precise performance and configurational technique. You get the same with Celtic knot work. Uh, with illumination. So we get like ton, tons of these pages. Uh, which Ruskin in the material of ornaments, yes, a really interesting line on on almost all these lines are expressive of action or force of some kind. Talks about that that diagram. So for him, it's really ribboning is really about the center line, right? It's it's not the outline of a patch, but it's really the center line that drives the force and that and that creates the object. <coughs> so there's some. Like, like what I did with tessellation, you get some techniques to create braided surfaces by bending, interlacing, tendrilling, bifurcating. So you get like the different figures, like from the, from the Gothic, you get different types of figures. C and S figure, X figure, J figure, tendrilling, basically the spiral or the scroll, and the Y and T figure, which are typical figures of growth, right? Because the, the first, the C and the S figure that you also see with the, with the with Ruskin, that way when he traces the outline of a leaf or the ballistics of a, of a, of a cannonball, right, that's a C figure, which is not as complex, of course. Or these are X figures because of the interlacing. And here you get the, the bifurcations of, of growing hinges over a door, which for me became really important when I looked at them. And I started looking at them because of Gombrich has a very, in the sense of order, the word already says enough. Uh, you get a very small image of a Gothic hinge, and I started to look at Gothic hinges, and I said, how interesting this actually is, because if you look at this parametrically, you would start like with a two-dimensional door surface and with a line, the hinge line, and that's of course, that line is not strong enough, it needs to like spread out over the surface. So it needs to make that transition of, of one to two dimensions, of 1D to 2D, and it does it by, by growing over it, basically. Cheers. <laughs> it, it does it by growing over it, and it uses the Y figure, and it ends with the J figure. So you get the Y figure to like, have that system split. You cannot break the continuity of the line because the hinge wouldn't work anymore. Right? So this is, a, this is an element that, that starts very clean with 1D as a strip, and it grows out over. And it's not the image. Of course, an art critic or an art historian would say, oh, that's the tree of life. Right? That's all symbolism. Jenks would say, well, that's the tree of life. But it's not, it's not an image applied to something. It might work as a symbol later, but it's actually the act, the act of the element, right? That actually that hinge, that hinge start to like grow over that door and becomes an, a transit dimension, what we now call a fractal. If I would ask a mathematician what the, what the dimension of that black hinge is, he would say, well, Maybe it's 1.267, whatever, like a really a fractal number, right? because that line sort of breaks out. And you can, you can make a whole Bible out of these, these Gothic hinges. You can just photograph them all over the world, and it would be all perpetual novelty. They'd be all different. They'd be all different. They would still have rules, right? because it, there are rules of, of transition. There are rules of, of scrolls and Y shapes and J shapes and, and how to apply these figures. But basically, they're all like these transitory systems. And then I thought, yeah, that, that, that's easy because it's about real forces. And I started thinking about Morris, right? Because Morris is doing the same, but then with vertical vines, right? And these vines grow out. He actually uses the word growth, right? So we are now not C lines anymore and S lines. The S line comes, of course, from Hogarth, serpentine line. But we're really now with growth figures that generate systems. And we have, we have, this is quite incredible, because if you, if you look at Morris, you would always see like vines or twigs and leaves and flowers, right? So you would have linear elements, you would have like leaf-like elements, and you would have radial elements, that, like dots, and they would be the flowers. But if in the acanthus wallpaper, you just have leaves, but they act as, as flowers. If they scroll up a lot over there, that acts like a flower, right? And that acts as a vine. Ah. Oh, we're done almost. <laughs> Bloody hell. Okay, I think I'm here. Boom, boom, boom. Okay, 
into the net. So, but of course, you need to tile it. It's wallpaper, so you still get the issue of tessellation, right? But that's that's repetition. The fact that the thing grows over the surface is multiplication. That's two different things. So it needs to tessellate it for technical reasons. But look at how complex the tile is. That's not your typical Owen Jones tile, right? That's a very irregular tile. It's very difficult to fit them in each other, right? So I'm not saying here that we should be against repetition and do all kinds of weird stuff. I think it's much more about how to generate a surface through an undetermined lower scale element that's, that's still like a sub-element or, or a non-part. And that starts to interact and then creates a patch. <coughs> and then it's multiplied. Incredible wallpaper. Very expensive. Yeah, that's just one with, with leaves and twigs without any flowers. We actually built a three-dimensional one with students. <coughs> Very interesting. Yeah, this, the moment you sort of understand what these numbers mean, like leaf 129, twig 8, flower 0, you can just like build sliders and can generate. Yeah, I'm actually describing it in the book as a, as a software package, Tangle, Tangle Carpet. And you, you would actually have like sliders. Because a lot of people understand what I wrote, that it's about do it yourself. And uh, that's not at all the case. Uh, somebody of the Times Literary, uh, of course, that's a literary critic. So they, they read it as a message or as that it evokes a meaning, but it's only an image of meaning, right? So this is all do it yourself. But if you would actually have the algorithms of Morris that we, we developed at, with my students, you can actually have sliders and you can create any carpet and any wallpaper. And you, would have, and you would have this on a website. You would have a price at the bottom. It would be great, no? You could make your own Morris. So it's not do it yourself, because you're an amateur. You're dumb, right? And we don't want to have dumb, dumb design. Do it yourself or open systems are not advocating dumb design. We are actually having the intelligent organizational power of something, of Morris, and Morris and Co., right? Because most of this is Henry Deere. It's not Morris at all. And I have all the power of, that, of, that, of these algorithms and that design, and you could generate it, but it's not you, you, right? You're just playing with sliders. Sympathy. So that's, that's the core of the argument. I'm, I'm, I hope I can sort of go through this a bit more quickly. Um, what time is it? How much do I have left? If you're like really kind. Huh? That means? Yeah. <laughs> but I started late, no? Yeah. Fifty? Huh? Fifty? Okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, sympathy. Th there's, there's two notions of sympathy. One is between the elements that make things, so they're inherent to the object. So I'm saying the ribs are sympathetic to each other. Then, when I look at it, when I look at that hinge, or when I look at that fold, I feel sympathy with it. Why? Because it is in the making. That transitory argument means it's not made like Owen Jones. It hits the second dimension, just stops, goes, goes to bed, goes to rest or repose. And life is out of it because it's not making anymore, but it's now made. And then your mind has to reconfigure the order that's in there, right? So that's a Kantian problem. With Owen Jones, you're always on the left, right? You get order or gestalt, and your mind has to reconfigure the order and then, with a smile, walk away from it. That's a sort of Kantian, Kantian aesthetics, right? But here we have something on the, on the right that's in the making. And that in the making, you cannot see because it's going somewhere. It's growing, right? So there's something that you see, and there's something that, that goes beyond the seeing. There's an exploratory space, which is a space of feeling, right? <coughs> so we can only have sympathy for things that are in the making. So my argument is that both the Gothic and ornament, especially in the way that William Morris sees it, are examples of things that are in the making. Examples of things that are in the making. So they're inherently sympathetic. 
I, I argue through uh, I argue through Bergson. Uh, there's a whole history of Berg, of of sympathy. I, when I would, would have written a book just about sympathy, I would have started with like Stoic philosophy, because in Stoic philosophy, the whole universe would be pervaded with sympathy. Planets would feel sympathy for each other. The way I stand on the ground is sympathy. That's not called gravity. It's called sympathy. And what plants feel for each other is sympathy. When I take a plant out of the forest and it heals me, that's a relation of sympathy. Right? When you read Foucault's Le Mo Le Shows, it starts with the sympathy of plants and how it cures us through similarity and through uh, the analog. So there's a, there's a whole, you can find a word in, 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 uh, with English or especially Gothic, uh, uh, Scottish uh, uh, empiricism. Um, David Hume. David Hume, we talk about a lot about sympathy. So there's a whole history of sympathy that I'm skipping in the book. I, s I start with Bergson, and Ber because Bergson has the best example of sympathy ever. It's, it's that wa wasp over there. And, th and the wasp is paralyzing a caterpillar. So the, the has, a, has a nest with eggs. And these eggs, ne eggs, when they hatch, they need to, these, these, little, these little wasps need to be fed. And she feeds them with a, with a living caterpillar, but it's paralyzed. So she goes out hunting. The wasp, the Ammophila wasp, goes out hunting to hunt the caterpillar. Now, the c whole question is, how is it possible that the wasp finds the nine nerve centers in the caterpillar and stings them to paralyze it. Boop. So it's paralyzed enough so she can drag it to her nest, put it in there, and then when the eggs hatch, they have fresh food. So one answer, ridiculous answer would be knowledge, right? That would be, <laughs> yeah. so somehow, the wasp has, has, in her little tiny brain, there's a Kantian epistemology, and their symbols are stored that allows her to reconfigure, because that's what Kantianism is. It's, it, there's a real phenomenon object. You have to somehow trace it back to an a priori object, so you have to map it back. That's, that only goes through knowledge. Now, that's a tricky argument. The other argument, the Richard Dawkins argument, of course, is instinct, right? So it's automatic. But now it's very, di it's very difficult to program. <laughs> it's very difficult to program an Imophila wasp because the caterpillar can be longer, thicker, can be quick, can be slow. So there's so many variations of behavior. It's very difficult to do that with software. Right, with instinct. So there's something in between, says Bergson. Somehow, the emophila wasp, like somebody dancing with another person, can, through Einfühlung. <laughs> yeah, what a, I love that word. Through empathy, can map the movements of the caterpillar into these points that she can find. That's intuition. So a thing is in the making, a thing is moving, a thing is changing. So there's movement, there's a duration, that's Bergson. But somehow through sympathy we can lock on to that movement. Exactly like the blacksmith, this is a Delanda argument, exactly like the blacksmith would create that actual Gothic hinge. Right? You, he's not working from a drawing, he's working through Einfühlung. He's like hitting and hammering and quenching and, and cutting and pulling and there, there's, uh, he is in this hot, red hot steel. He's in the red hot steel, exactly like the emophila. It's in the caterpillar. And when she's in there, she can sting. So it's, it's, it's intuition, but it's a very, or it's, it's a very elastic form of, of instinct, intuition is. It allows something to act on another object or to feel with another object without actually n having symbolic knowledge of it. Just in epistemology, this is far out. This is really incredible because it means it's immediate knowledge. It doesn't go through the mind. It goes through the body. It's a proprioceptive act. 
It's really the whole body as a brain that maps itself onto an outer body. Exactly what you do when you dance with somebody. Well, not me, but maybe somebody who can dance, right? Or how you drive a car. You somehow become that car, you sympathize with that car, and, you, and you're able to take the curve. You have become that body of four meters long. You don't get out of the car before you take the curve and then measure the curve and then put the wheel in the right angle. No, you drive, right? You, you, you don't drive the car, you are the car. So that's what's happening here. That's what's happening here. So there's a mimesis to it, but there's also prosthesis to it. There's, and you, you find the same in Xcule, Xcule. It is an um, um, amazing uh, 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 biologist who, who actually wrote a, a fantastic set of chapters on Streifzüge uh, in den Welt des Tieren, or whatever, foray into the world of animals and, 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 and humans. And he explains how of building a web that catches flies. He says, well, through sympathy, he uses the movements of the fly, so he becomes small enough to understand what the size of, of a fly is to make the density of the web. Right? Of course, Richard Dawkins would laugh and would say, look, this animal is programmed by evolution, and it always creates the same web. But clearly, that's not true. Right? Clearly, that's not true. There's webs that are mistakes. There's, there's tons of variation in there. So instinct doesn't really... And actually, what would a wet computer be? Why, if you would call something a computer, like Richard Dawkins does, what does that actually explain? Right? How would we be programmed? OK, so there's sympathy between the hinge and the door. There's sympathy between the hinge and the door. And when I look at it 800 years later, there's sympathy between me and the hinge and the door. That's ecology, right? So we, we're going from two agents to three and a whole community. So that, that's my ecological argument. This is really, that's the fifth chapter. I won't talk about the fifth chapter, but it really goes like really far away, anti There's There's a beautiful example because, of course, with sympathy, that's why that, that example of Bergson is so intelligent, right? Because he talks about sympathy and he, there's this cruel act of the wasp on the caterpillar, but it's not cruel at all. Is, is just paralyzing an animal to feed her children. Nothing bad with that. So, but that's why it's such an intelligent, it, intelligent example, because we think, wow. And Franz de Waal, in his book on empathy, actually talks about torturers. Torturers, torturing people. They're not capable of torturing other people without feeling their pain, without sympathy. So you cannot torture somebody else without knowing where the where the points are that you need to torture. Of course, he doesn't elaborate on that, <laughs> on that example. He goes to Cooney, the bonobo. <laughs> Cooney, Cooney sees a bird fly in her cage. It's a, it's a, it's a very expensive cage. It's, a, it's all apes in there. And uh, there's a glass wall. And there's a bird that flies against the glass wall. And Cooney sees that. Cooney, the bonobo, sees that. And she picks up the bird and, and climbs up the tree in, in her ca glass cage, in her Philip Johnson cage. And at the top tree uh, branch, she, she moves the wings and, and lets the bird fly, I hope. Because it doesn't say if she, like the bird drops down or something. It's not the point. <laughs> the point is that Kuni, while seeing a bird and does not have any biological knowledge of what a bird is or what wings are or what a beak is or whatever, through Einfühlung, becomes that bird, knows what these arms are because that's what the wings are and knows that these need to move to make her come back again to life. Right? So there's, there's, there's another sympathetic argument. Of course, this is clear clear concept of, of sympathy as, as a form of care, but it's, it's basically the same construction. Of course, I don't want to talk about that in the book, about inflicting pain, so I'm not doing that. <coughs> Very interesting moment in, uh, in Bergson is when all this argument becomes suddenly an aesthetic argument. 
He says, this is all the same way as a portraitist should paint a portrait. So it's aesthetic, right? This sympathetic feeling between things or between people and things or between people, right? This can all, can all be sympathetic is basically an aesthetic notion. So we have things, we have thing actions, and we have thing action feelings, right? And these feelings for each other, this basic friendship, this fellowship, between thi- this brotherhood between things can only be aesthetic. It's only that, that the, por- the portrait is a really brilliant example. It's only that Leaps, Theodore Leaps, because th- if you read this, and you read his descriptions of, of sympathy, you know, because it's in French, but you know it's talking about Einfühlung, which is really the German invention. Gottfried Herder, 1780-something, he talks about sympathy, and then we get Theodor Fischer, the father of Robert Fischer, talks about Einfühlung. And then comes Robert Fischer, does a whole thesis on Einfühlung. This 1875. And it all, be, with leaps, it takes this and it becomes incredible. And I, th- I think really, because we always talk about Boringer as the advocate of Einfühlung, but it, yes, he, he really misread Theodor Leaps. And, and Leaps has. Is, is, is there are some really interesting terms and in leaps about Einfühlung. Actually, later in English, we translate Einfühlung with empath- empathy. But he has the syn- synonym of sympathy, right? So leaps, if you read leaps in German, you will read sympathy all the time. <coughs> Why do we feel sympathy for somebody on a high wire, right? Why, when he walks on a high wire, and he moves or tr- almost triples, why do we immediately pull up our legs or our arms or our face? Right? Why do we plot these movements inside of us because of inra nachamu? Right? So it's not an external mirroring, it's an internal mirroring. Right? It's an internal mirroring. That's the whole secret of Einfühlung. That's the whole secret of aesthetics. And of course, we know mimesis, right, of naturalism. So we think it's external. It's external, but external uh, mirroring is just like a, a, a sub-branch, so to speak, of, of in in Nachamu. And he has tons of examples, tons of examples. Man on a high wire, a flying bird, a willow tree in a storm. It's incredible. And it's all about these, these objects that he gets transported into. That's the word he uses. He gets transported into. But you're never sure when you read lips if it's like objective, Right, because in, in aesthetic, it's either an objective thing that radiates out of the object, or it's a subjective thing that we project into it. N- nor- the mistake of all the psychologists after Leaps is that they, they categorize Einfühlung as subjective, basically as a subjective mistake. Right? It's a mistake when you, do, when you feel into a vase, when you feel into a flying bird, when you feel into a rock, it's a mistake. It's our primitive, uh, primitive part of our brain. It's, uh, we have n- mirror neurons, right? So most people that still like empathy in, in neurophenomenology, they would always talk about mirror neurons. Now, for me, it's not about the, how the brain is wired. It's really how objects interrelate with each other. Now, he gives examples of, of, of moving structures, so things moving, right? So we feel into things because they're in the making. Right, they're in the making, and and what's interesting is that, of course, you f- when you when he feels rage when he's looking at the willow tree, he's not saying the rage is in the willow tree. It's your rage, right? You're upset, or you feel exalted, or you feel excited. That's an aesthetic, but it doesn't mean that the tree doesn't feel anything. Right? There's feeling in the tree, and there's feeling in you, and they collaborate. They resonate with each other. Yeah, so you see the bird. That's clear. Right? You see the bird flying. But there's also a notion of what is invisible. Because if you just see the bird, you would, ta- you would take a snapshot. Right? And you would take a sort of mental picture. But there's no flying there. There's just the bird in a position. So there's something you see and there's something that isn't, you can't see. And that has to be felt. Right? So that trajectory of that object, in this case a bird or a willow tree or the, or the man on the highway, which has an actual path, 
right? The object and, and, and the path of movement are seen and felt, right? So the object is seen, but the path is felt. The feeling is really a sort of uh, preparing of the body into a certain type of movement. Now what's interesting, he then goes to things that don't move at all, right, scientifically speaking. Right? The horns of the antelope don't move, but they're grown. So already when looking at the spiral, I follow it in a separate proportion successively. I am making the spiral come into existence for me, you see. He relives the growth of the object. The existence of the spiral is a becoming, right? So now we have the path object, right? So we have a movement, the, a moving object, and we have a changing object. And he puts them together, right? He says basically this, these are the same. So an object that is moving and an object that has, has grown, think of Morris's wallpaper, think of a Gothic column, because of course I sympathize with the, mo that's actually a text of leaps, right? I sympathize with the manner the column behaves, this is action, or testifies to an inner liveliness, this is vitalism, Be because I recognize there in the natural mode of behavior of my own that gives me happiness. So he is uplifted by the column. He is uplifted by the car. And Wolfling, some years later, Wolfling, take, the famous art historian, takes that over when he, and he talks about a dome swelling upwards. Right? There's no balance, there's no rest. It's a swelling upwards, and you feel that swelling inside of me. Probably you even breathe with it. So the, 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 the aesthetic notion of, of, of an object being alive and moving and an object being alive and growing and changing are for Einführung are the same same thing, because it's all in the making. It's all in the making. <coughs> so these are the three stages of sympathy. It starts with empathy, it feels into, but then it feels with, right? It resonates with, you can actually spend time with it, living with. In Dutch that would be invoelen, meevoelen, and meeleven, right? So in German you would have einfühlen and, and mietfühlen, but you do, don't have mietleven, right? That's where you go really sympathetic, with sympathy plus. <laughs> that is, I, I really live with you. Of course, Leben mit dir is, is really bad German, so that's, uh, it would be meaningless. meaningless. So, it's not that thing on the left, right? It's, it's not internal mirroring with external mirroring, right? It's internal mirroring. It's, it's two d different disparate objects. They're different objects, but they resonate with each other. And it's not just the hinge on the door. It can be so somebody sitting on a rock. Because how is it possible that you go sit on a rock? How is it possible? I mean, of course, a, ch a chair. I mean, we've been trained to sit on a chair. Dawkins again, right? We've been programmed to sit on a chair, so we know how to sit on a chair. But go sit on a rock. Somehow you have to plot the form of the, of the rock into your body and then take share and then share these points right because two very disparate bodies a rock and a body are sharing points exactly like the hinge and the door are sharing points with with and while they're being different right so we're still talking pluralism here it's not a monistic folded world it's a pure pluralist world but they engage with each other through feeling and th after feeling through action Still with me? I'm feeling is the fact that the opposition between myself and the object disappears. So sometimes leap is not so clear, but there are sentences where you really see the whole phenomenological structure of subject and object just collapse, right? So we have, we have two notions of beauty. And of course, objective beauty, proportion, harmony, you send it to somebody's brain and, the, and that brain becomes happy. Right, the Kantian notion or the, or the, or the Renaissance notion of, of beauty, that's of course Roger Scruton trying to sort of reinstate that form of beauty like Prince Charles and, and lots of others. It's not true, it's not true. But the other hand, you would have the Kantians and the, and the Jungians that say, no, no, we just project. And the same with Darwin, if you read The Descent of Man, by the way, The Descent of Man is, is only a, a quarter of the book is on The Descent of Man and the other three quarters are about beauty. So that you should really read that, sexual selection and beauty and how, how that works. But the, 
Darwin fully subscribes to that Jungian notion of, of sub, uh, subjectivity. So we project our idea of beauty onto the object. I think they're both wrong. I think both sort of objects send out information. So that you, there, is, there is an objective notion, but it's, it's not pure. You don't understand it as objectivity. You intuit with it. You resonate with it. You synchronize with it as an other body. You make a direct connection. It's much more immediate than any m mindful aesthetic connection, m much more direct than any, any encoding of aesthetic proportions. So it's really a, a subject and object merging in, into an ecological node. Five minutes left? Oh, that was it? Oh. Well, yeah, I, I got this fantastic chapter. Yeah. <laughs> but now, let, let me tell you, Whitehead is really is sort of the star behind the curtain in the book. It's, I'm reading Ruskin through the eyes of, of Whitehead. And Whitehead, it, and really, is over 70 years old. He writes this incredible book. There's, of course, Process and Reality, but The Adventure of Ideas, he talks about beauty as really the force in the universe. That's the for, that's a value, inherent value. So he says there's no facts. There's no things as facts. There's only f things as values. Everything is experienced and felt. He talks about feeling all the time. And it's feeling that drives the notion of composition. I mean, Latour talks a lot about composition, but not the feeling for composition. How can you have composition without things feeling for each other? That would just not compose. You get the same with Deleuze and assemblage theory. These things have effects, but the effects don't attune with each other. And this is really about attunement. So things attune to create beauty. Can you believe it? This is an incredible idea. The teleology of the... Teleology is using a word that has been banned for like 150 years in philosophy. But it's not an overall theology. It's not like God throwing things into the right order and making them beautiful. No, no, it's things themselves that want to be happy and, and aim for a beauty. So it's compositional, but in a, in a sort of mini teleology, right? Things have aims and they build beautiful things, but they don't control these beautiful things. But it's not purely contingent either. Thank you.